mouth breathers thanks for joining me again on misery point radio appreciate you taking a break from contaminating society and hanging out with me again here in this wasteland of internet radio trust me the world doesn't miss you but i do besides while you're sitting there alone in the dark i'm not judging you for touching your face or wearing a speedo and doing that thing with your hands that you think people don't see i'm totally cool with it hey We're all fake friends here, so relax. Your secret is almost safe with me. Anyway, today's guest, Terry Jenkins, plays in a melodic death metal band called Dramora, who released their debut EP, Awakening, just a few days ago. And before you ask me if that's a Skyrim reference, this is a spoiler-free zone. Listen to the whole goddamn thing, you lazy bastards. Anyway, this conversation was epic for a number of reasons. Number one, it was the first time in a long time that I got to do an in-person interview. Number two, Dramore is one of the most unique bands I've been introduced to in a long time. And number three, Terry and his band are busting their asses to help revitalize the Seattle area metal scene, which has been struggling to regain its identity for quite some time now. So, needless to say, I was very excited when I first heard Dramora and found out they were local to me. Special shout out to John Asher from Asher Media Relations for introducing me to Dramora and helping to set this up. We covered a lot in this conversation. The origin of the band, the idea behind their concept, the recording process, musical influences, video games, the Seattle metal scene, or lack thereof, and what it will take to truly bring things back to life. I'm really excited to share this with you. I promise this is an amazing conversation. So, put that Dark Brotherhood quest on pause, change out of that ridiculous Khajiit outfit, and welcome to Misery Point Radio, Terry Leroy Jenkins. Hey, Terry, thanks for joining me today, man. Appreciate you inviting me into your studio. It's been a really long time since I got to do an in-person interview, and I've been really looking forward to doing this. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. It was a long ass drive. Uh, where exactly was it again? Yeah, I'm out in Kitsap County, a couple hours away. It's definitely a nice drive, but you know, anything I can do to get out of the house is awesome. Because so you're out in Kitsap, you are. Um, I don't remember the name of the town though. So I'm in a I'm in a town called Port Orchard. I'm about uh, probably. No, that's a pretty well known town though. Yeah, 30 miles south of Gig Harbor, which is just south of Tacoma, which is just south of Seattle. <laughs> so it's pretty south. Yeah, it's pretty south for sure. It's a nice area though. I like it. It's rural, um, but it still has access to kind of all the cool stuff. And I live right by a ferry, and I work in downtown Seattle. So I hop on the South Worth area and I can get down to downtown and have access to all of this stuff, which I don't want to have access to right now. But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, it's an area that I think the Seattle area is pretty rich with, you know, musical history and artistic history. Yeah, I history. actually know a lot of Tacoma artists and I know a lot of the venues there and uh, a lot of the close relationships that I have with people in the Was- in Washington state are not really in Seattle. Yeah, you know, we always use like Seattle as kind of the, I guess, the stopping point. Well, you if know, someone's listening to this and they're not from Washington, yeah, you're you're probably going to think like Seattle is the, it is what Washington is, right? But I mean, this state is so fucking weird. I think like the right when you go over the mountains, it's like an entirely different state. And Spokane is another place where I see I'm more in tune with the people there, um, just because they they're way more into extreme music by a long shot and not just metal, but like extremes on everything, like yeah. electronic music. I think when you live out there or you live in like a rural area, like <clears throat> I know that people probably know what Tacoma where, you know, probably know the name Tacoma and stuff like that. Um, there's not a lot of places in the United States named Tacoma. I, I know that too. It's really, it's true. <laughs> it's pretty, but, yeah. Uh, pretty um, original. We have a lot of, uh, native American named, Everything. In fact, Seattle is Native American name. Yep. Tacoma, or Snohomish County, Kitsap, all that stuff. Those are all Native American pronunciations of 
stuff. I love when people come here and they try to say Puyallup and it just fucks with their heads. <laughs> Puyallup, yeah. <laughs> Puyallup. Yeah, we, it's Snohomish that? County. That's where we are right here. Yeah. yeah. So yep, they're, all, they're all Native American names, but it's like, uh, I think this place, you know, it's it's weird. Like you said, you you drive from, like when you met me outside before this, you drive from where you are to here. But you kind of like, you go through all of the mess back to it being sort of rural again almost you know yeah and it's like it is it's like there's this mess of crap in the middle of the state and that or in the middle of the west side of the state next to where all the ports are and yep. you know that's kind of where the hub is where everything comes in and goes out in seattle yeah for sure um but yeah i i love where you're from i love that area it's nice because you know you get all the all the cool elements of you know, not super congested living, but you're within immediate access to everything that you need. And, you know, like I, I'm fortunate enough, I, I live kind of on the water and we're surrounded by trees and I live in a neighborhood that's not really a neighborhood. It's kind of like you drive through it, but all the houses are down big driveway. So it's not like you have, totally. yeah, you know, stuff all over the road and it's really very quiet where I'm at. But then, you know, if I drive 20 minutes, I'm in the heart of everything, you know, right. it's, it's pretty legit. And I guess that's conducive to what you and I do in, in the music world is, I mean, it's like sometimes your brain wants to kind of take a step back from everything and focus on the writing elements or on the creative elements. And sometimes your brain is shut down and you want to go and get out in the middle of all the chaos and kind of absorb all that. Yeah, definitely. So, and, and I found myself in that for a long time as well, you know, that it's just like when my brain won't turn off, I need to back away. But then when I'm feeling that lack of creativity, I just kind of want to go where all the stuff's going crazy. Yeah. I really miss, um, playing shows a lot, um, and going to shows. I mean, I also did live sound at a bar here. Um, Tony V's mm -hmm. and I mean I just saw tons of people all the time and I was always you know just talking to folks and bands and whatever and it just as soon as this was uh in place you know and it, it looked like you know things weren't gonna get back to that again or whatever I don't know I, I didn't feel scared you know I'm not the type of person that has a problem with change or something mm -hmm. but I mean I, I welcome Anything that comes at me, I'm kind of ready to, you know, absorb it and start to adapt. But uh, there's a few things that uh, I'm going to be really sad that, you know, don't come back. I I know we just signed on to a tour for uh, 20 dates with Head PE, and Head PE is a national band. They're obviously big. Um, and I didn't, I don't even know what's going to happen with that. Yeah. It's like, it's pretty up in the air. Like at this point, you know, the dates are somewhere at the end of the year. I'm not going to give any dates or anything. Cause I, I can't do that. I probably get in trouble. <laughs> um, but I know they're at the, I know that they we're talking like end of the year, sometime around the end of the year. And, you know, as we talked to each other, I talked to the tour manager and stuff. They're like, all right, we're just kind of waiting to see what happens. And then we'll solidify some more stuff. And now that everything went back into phase one, you know, I don't know. I have not talked to, I don't want to talk to him now. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try to avoid, but who knows if, if uh, everything just gets postponed even further or canceled or whatever happens. Um, I cannot, I don't want to live in a world where there's not shows coming through town. I mean, it just, I don't know. It's been a part of my life and a humongous part of it, not just the local scene, but like, you know, Ozfest used to come through and stuff like that. And people, yeah. people, you know, there's people who gripe about that shit. I'm not one of them. I liked Ozfest. I like going to the White River Amphitheater and seeing them. <laughs> I fucking like doing that stuff. You like sitting on the road for 22 hours? And I not fucking, <laughs> I love that shit, man. Yeah. I fucking love it. It's, it's, I've never gotten tired of it. I love the aspect of it. I like being a part of a big crowd of people. I like being part of a mob, you know, in, yeah. in that aspect. And, I've seen a lot of bands there. I just saw Gojira there and Slipknot. Yeah, Gojira is oh my God. super epic. Yeah, It's cool to listen to, to Gojira yeah. in your car and crank it up. It feels good. It's yeah. even fucking cooler when there's like thousands of people around you that feel exactly the same and you're watching that thing together. Oh, yeah. I don't want that to not be a thing. I want that to go on forever. So that uh, that being a thing that looks like it's going to go away makes me really fucking sad. Yeah, you and I are in the same club there because, you know, I grew up listening to music and I grew up playing music and the concert experiences probably have the majority of 
epic memories um, from when I was a kid to a teen into early 20s and 30s. And now maybe your tastes change a little bit over the years. But, you know, I love going to concerts and seeing bands. I like walking up and going to the merch table and buying, you know, shirts and see i'm still i still love cds and vinyls and uh, physical stuff and you know it's it's not just about listening i mean you can sit home and listen to the radio or sit home and listen to cds and shit like that but i like going and feeling like there's a whole event a whole experience that you kind of take with you forever on that so yeah if if for some reason that was to just go away i i definitely would have a super super difficult time with that and in, in fact I'm supposed to go to do some interviews and to see some shows in North Carolina here coming up. It was supposed to go uh, a couple months back. Uh, Violence, the band, um, they're kind of rebooting stuff and they were getting ready to kind of go back out on tour. And then that fell apart. And then they're like, okay, we're rescheduling it. And then now North Carolina is a hot spot. And so who Fuck, kn- dude. I know. Yeah. It's, it's just fucking crazy <laughs> how it's like. I think that as human beings, you know, actually, I'm not a Buddhist or anything, okay? So I'll sure. just, I'm going to preface what I'm about to say with that. <laughs> but I, I definitely... Qualifier. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I am not a Buddhist. However, I do admire a lot of the teachings and principles. In sure. There, and I try to, uh, you know, uh, adhere some of those to my own life so that I don't fucking go crazy because I do a lots of shit. Yeah. Um, I, I have my hands on tons of different things. And right after this, I'm going to help someone set up a theater with sound and stuff like that. You know, like I'm just always busy. Yeah. So I try to like just live in the moment because if I get too caught up thinking about how much I have to do or how much have I, I've agreed to do or whatever, that never works out for me. I always feel overwhelmed if I'm in that mind. So I always kind of think like, you know, just like what we're doing right now. I'm enjoying this. You know? Yeah. I, I'm here. We're talking about stuff. I'm not going to think ahead. I'm not going to think behind, you know, whatever sort of thing and just live that way. But just saying that, I realize how full of shit I am because my <laughs> my need to fucking plan things is what my whole fucking life is about because yeah. people need to know what's going to happen in the future so that we can all spend money because yeah. it's gobs of money to make a tour. Oh and yeah. It's gobs of money to put on a show. It's, it's, it's like, there's so much monetary things going on and then we have to figure out like, how are we going to recoup? Are we going to be able to do this again afterwards? So on and so forth. So we have to know what is the expectation of what's going to happen in the future. And just when people think they think they're going to fucking, Oh, well, look at this. Everything is clearing back up. Everyone's going back out. Boom. It comes back. So it's like without being able to plan anything, I see people planning stuff in like next June, next July, stuff like that. I don't see anything before that. And some people are saying even that's not safe. So I'm just like, how is that not fucking safe? You're telling me this shit is going to stick around until next July? Like, my God. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about dealing with the realm of the unknown is that people that are planners find themselves now having to be very reactionary to things, and it pulls us out of our element sometimes. And, you know, hey, I'll be the first person to admit that sometimes I can be so regimented it doesn't leave any room for flexibility, and that's not the way to be either. But, yeah, this uh, constantly day-by-day thinking on your feet, what's going to happen today, I'm having a hard time adjusting to that myself. It's tough, man, and I think the other thing is that there's a whole nother set of, you know, emotions that have come about for a lot of people with things being that way, because so much of things have to be planned. But I know there's a lot of people who have mental health issues sure. that are fucking in the dirt. Right yeah, now. they're having a rough time. There is more people I know that um, just in the past few months, I know, like, personally know people who have killed themselves yeah dude and it happened after this you know people getting stuck inside that already were fucked up i mean dude i don't drink anymore because i have a kind of a predisposition to be depressed um i'm not depressed unless i use substances and so just just, magnifies it makes it worse right i'm able to deal with just about anything unless i'm hung over every day and fucking or you know this weed uh makes me depressed too it's a weird it's like it just kind of brings me down enough to where like i never can get back up and uh so like but i know there's people out there that you know they're just even without drugs or anything anything keeping them down they like that's a struggle for them so you know pile this shit on top of them and fuck you know so there's just so much going on man i 
you know, uh, not to misery up the misery point. Well, hey, that's you know, it's a very, it's a very metal <laughs> I concept. How negative this is getting. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, it's it's you know, we could talk about that all fucking day. Point oh yeah, is, is that um, we don't know what the fuck is going to happen, and you have to just be okay with that. Yeah. I guess. Well, I, I guess that you know, kind of brings me to something I was thinking about, which is a lot of bands put things on hold for the time being, you know, whether or not it's a release or a tour or an announcement or this and that. And Dramora went ahead and released kind of a, but not like in your face release. It wasn't like a plastered, like, Hey, fuck you. Buy my shit. Here it is. I know you got your stuff going on. So what was the decision to release Awakening in the midst of everything, was it just that it had already been planned and you figured, what the hell, let's just give some people another alternative to kind of occupy their their minds and, and get through stuff? No. Um, well, the I left Odyssean, my last band, and I, I put a lot of fucking work into that band. I yeah. was, I've been a death metal drummer, you know, and a metal drummer, a thrash drummer, um, and I actually was in a band that was more like, I guess, I guess death tonesy kind of sounding. I was a sure. drummer and a, and a thing like that. Um, but the last thing I was, you know, and probably the most known for is the drummer for Odyssean for like the last three or four years. And uh, we had some disagreements in writing and how the direction of the band was going to go. A lot of the guys wanted to get more experimental and I wanted to say, get more heavy, get more like, you know, as we were talking about it, but more towards the Gojira side of things. Less bullshit, more more good content, less tweedly meedly kind of shit. And uh, <laughs> no, you know, like I've been doing that for fucking ever, dude. It's just like it's not that I don't like music like that. It's just I don't want to fucking play music like that, right? Like I fucking dig Tech Death. I listen to it all the time. Like I love Arch Spire and fucking I I love that kind of shit. Flub. Um, I love all the new tech deaths coming out. We'll just leave it at that. And um, it's just when I go to sit down and, and, and write stuff, I think as I gotten older, I just, I don't have as many insecurities surrounding my, uh, I guess my motives for making music. And, um, you know, I just don't care <laughs> about if someone doesn't think I'm a good guitar player or, you know, or whatever the fuck. I, it just doesn't even matter to me anymore. I just want to make, I'm like really like in a, like a phase where it's like, I want to make something melodic yeah, and like, you know, something that like, I want something to, to when I write it, it like gives me goosebumps and yeah. I can feel it, you know? Um, and not always in like a creepy way or like a happy way or an angry way, but however the fuck I feel, you know? And I want it to be more of like songwriting and less like writing guitar parts that just go to another fucking guitar part. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just I didn't want to do that anymore. And I'm only prefacing all that because when I left Odyssean, you know, and we parted ways, um, they're I don't think doing anything anymore because I mean that was that can that's not a it's not a recipe for longevity for a lot of bands. You either grow out of it or some of the people grow out of it, or you're just really sick of playing to five people. I'm sorry, but tech death bands, even when they come through here that are established, <laughs> sometimes play to fucking fifteen people. I know. So if you don't want to do that anymore, and I mean if you're genuinely not interested in it anymore and you want to move on, that's where I was. I was I was driven to do something that I been just i felt like i was bound to what i was for such a long time i started writing this stuff and um i put it together and writing some lyrics and i had some serious you know emotional stuff to get out anyway so i was like this is great this feels awesome stuff was really just kind of rolling out the problem was is that I was not established at all. And when I was trying to reach out to see like if I could get some bigger shows with the bands that I had already played with before. Right. Like I'd played some really big shows with really big bands and I had already had a lot of networking, but people were like, well, what does it sound like? What is it? What is it? And you'll try to explain it, you know, and you didn't have a sample to give. Well, I did, but it wasn't like great. You know, it was like a demo. So I was like, so it wasn't a true representation of no really what way. you were going for. Yeah, it didn't have nothing was like the way I wanted it to sound. So I guess to answer the question, once we recorded it and get and everything happened, then the COVID thing shut down. It still didn't matter because I just needed something to sort of prove that I could do this. Right. That I wasn't just the drummer guy and that I could fucking sing 
and play guitar and write. And I have way more material coming out the pipe. I got a full album. Yeah. I'm already going to have that going. So this is, um, I came up with the art concept. I worked with the artist to get the art done. Uh, I wrote all the lyrics. I wrote all the songs. I wrote all the arrangements. I engineered all of it. I mixed it. You know, I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm kind of proving without a doubt that if I, if I try to contact, to contact someone to go on a tour or I contact someone for a show, that the confidence is in me. And right. I needed that proof on the Internet that this is what the band sounds like. <laughs> I've done it. I have more in store. You know, and I think that that's really fucking important. I didn't realize that was such a big thing until you start to try to, to make stuff happen. It's like people have to, they're kind of, you know, there's lots of bands out there. Yeah. They, you have to, you know, I have to sell Terry to right. these people because when it comes down to it, the other members of the band, I mean, they're great musicians, but they, I don't think, want anything to do with any kind of business dealings. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. They just want to play the music and you handle the business side and of it. And I want them to do that. Yeah. I, I realize their personality types are that way. And so it's in my best interest to just allow them to lean into what they're good at, you know? So this isn't the Terry show. This is a band project, but you just happen to be the one, at least at this juncture, that kind of got the wheel spinning. Yeah. And you've got material written. Um, is there any kind of a collaborative effort going on as you, as you kind of work towards new material? Taylor doesn't really want to write lyrics for it. I think. Well, Taylor was the he was the uh, he's the vocalist, and he was the vocalist in Odyssean, and they weren't doing anything. Yeah. And, and his vocals are sick as fuck. By dude, the way, dude, he is such a good metal vocalist. It's yeah. insane. He's got such an insane range. And when he comes here and we record his vocals. He gets he like knocks whole songs out in like an hour and a half, Ugh. and he's like got the doubles perfectly lined up. I don't even have to fucking do anything. Like, there's so many vocalists I've recorded that there's so much to do to their voice to get it to the point where it sounds like an album ready version of their fucking voice, lining up the doubles, you know, and all that sort of shit, and, and so much distortion and all the stupid shit. His voice sounds like that. And I, I knew that because we played hundreds and hundreds of fucking shows together. Plus, I knew he was a great live performer. So I contacted him. I said, hey, you know, check this shit out. You know, maybe you don't like it because it's got singing in it. Ha, 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 or something, you know. Right. And he's like, no, this shit's rad. I want to I want to be a part of it. So um, he doesn't want to. He wants to be a part of it. He doesn't want to write the lyrics, I think, mainly because. Which is odd for a singer. I think the thing is about Taylor is that if he writes about stuff, it's he's a very he's like fictional. Um, you know, it's it's like he's telling a story from the perspective of something totally different, you know, and uh, right. his he doesn't write something that would make sense for this band to put out at this moment. Now, he does. I think we've talked about it before, and I think he wants to start writing things more in real life situations and not so much fantasy, fictional type, sure. you know, um, topics. But I think metal, it's pretty it's pretty common that people don't write the kind of stuff I'm writing. You know, I think it's pretty more it's more standard for people to write about fucking just, a, you know, really generic, but, you know, demons and fucking stuff like that. Right. Going to hell. Supernaturally and, kind of shit. Yeah, that's more common than someone, like, putting their dick out on the table and being like, I'm hurt. I'm yeah. fucking sad, you know, or I'm happy or something like that. And uh, I think that that shit's important. I think that, like, um, Devin Townsend is a huge influence on yeah. me. And he was one of the first people to write some, like, re in my world, to write something really brutal but to have some like real life situations going on. In it. And he surrounds himself with badass musicians too. Oh, yeah, definitely. And you know, yeah, Devin Townsend is kind of one of those unsung heroes that uh, probably has inspired a lot more people than anybody will ever give him credit for. That's for sure. Yeah. No, but yeah, back in the day, strapping young lad, I knew that I wanted to be, I wanted to do something like that. When I, I saw them on my uh, 19th birthday at the Elko around here Oh. and uh, they had Gene Hoagland. It was around the time alien, was well see no it would have been right before the new black fuck i can't even remember but <laughs> i know that i was there and i knew the songs i wanted to see and he played everyone they played like consequence aftermath love yeah. city oh my fucking god all those great songs but all those songs are about things that they're about real things they're about things that are like a humans go through yeah like i'm insecure and 
I don't know how to talk about it. And I'm having trouble sleeping because I fucking think I'm the worst person on earth. And there's just topics in every one of those songs. And uh, I gravitated to that. Not just me, but a lot of people. And I don't think that that ruined his credibility as a metal musician by any sense. No. So just seeing someone else do it, you know, and another person is like Jamie Josta from Hatebreed. I, I like to cite him. Like they they can sound kind of dated to some people, but I think um, I think Jamie's still very relevant. And I think uh, another person who's con- cont- you know his contributions to heavy music are you know you cannot deny that shit hatebreed is a humongous band yeah and the lyrics are paper thin and that's not just that's not like a dig on them or something like that it's like there's a song it's like you know fuck what's the destroy everything it's like it's about overcoming like adversity like destroy everything that's in your path that's fucking with you you know and it just says it like over and over and over (laughs) you know that song's huge song rage against the machine is kind of known to do that too they kind of take a theme right and then they just pound your fucking head with it until you walk away from that going and now i'll do what they told me i guess (laughs) you know uh, okay i've been hearing it now for the last three minutes and 37 seconds uh yeah i'm gonna go out now and and do that right so i guess what i'm saying is taylor doesn't want to he doesn't want to collaborate at the moment it's just a thematic thing he wants to be able to represent your vision he's definitely got enough personal stuff to pull from i've just surprised he doesn't want to he's more than welcome to it just uh I have no problem. I I can sit and fucking write shit every day. I usually do try to write something every day or every other day, even if it's not something I'm going to fucking use. Sure. Well, that being said, then, you released a five-song EP. Why not release a full length? Uh, because I, that's exactly what it was for, in my eyes, was... It Just was, to get the idea out there? I thought it was five really good songs. I thought they were they were good. I thought they were well put together. They were definitely all finished, and I didn't want to fuck with them anymore. I definitely had other material and other s- stuff I could have just added to that. But I felt like, okay, this song, like Home, songs, you know, it's got, it sh- kind of showcases some, I would say, you know, more technical, you know, people use the word gent. I fucking hate that word, but mashuga esque stuff with some more. Cause like, I think when I go to write, I really love hardcore. I, it's like so. I was thinking that if I can interrupt you on ahead, this, yeah. <laughs> that was exactly when I was listening for the first time. And I mean, when you when you hear Dramora, you hear elements of all different kinds of music, and in your brain, it shouldn't work, right? If you try <laughs> to if you try to overanalyze it, you're like, uh, what the fuck is this guy doing? And there's so much going. But the hardcore, I was getting bits and pieces of old New York hardcore, like prong, like right. the rhythms. I was getting a lot of that kind of stuff. But yeah, and then gent, if that's even a thing, I don't know. But I mean, there's, there's some periphery kind of yeah, sounding yeah, like right. you know but i think it's defined by like the tight choppy pulsating rhythm right Which is de- definitely yeah. is something i love yeah and then you combine that with you know elements of i mean there's straight ahead old school style death metal and then and then at the same time then it moves into kind of more like the the hardcore metal like carcass i mean you, you have some carcass elements in there with the with the dual vocals going on and then you have this crazy thing that sounds almost like it could belong as a Seattle sound like guilt comes in and I could hear that intro verse being sung by Chris Cornell because of a stylistic, oh. not so much how the voice sounds, but just kind of the way the say, phrasing works. Um, let's yeah. not compare me <laughs> to the legend, but no, yeah. definitely. I understand that. Yeah. yeah it is, it's so it's like you guys have taken all these elements of, of death metal, of hardcore, of the stuff that shall not be called gent uh pro- <laughs> we'll call it progressive rock right, right? right you know and there's some power metal but you know what you were saying a minute ago is it's not filled with fluff right it's not right. you're not going off on guitar solos and you're not having all these super long breakdowns your songs are all very much close together like they're all between say three minutes and 20 seconds and just under four minutes but they don't follow a formula it's not like the same thing on every one of those so you've managed to capture a variety of sounds a variety of different styles and make them all work 
Um, I really love like those little mini acoustic kind of transitions uh, that I think bring back in with the heavy, heavy guitars and stuff. So, um, and then you have two songs, you know, like, uh, like reckoning, um, which is all straight ahead fucking death, right? It it's is. Just, yeah. It's just boom, 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 boom. Just chugs. <laughs> yeah. It chugs. I'm looking at your yeah. helix down there with the chug preset. Um, yeah. And, and then you have other songs that kind of have a, you know, between the buried and me kind of vibe to it where the vocals kind of kick in so i think right now is actually the perfect time to check out one of these songs and we're going to take a listen to a song that is a true representation of the kind of vocal and musical stylistic diversity that dramora is known for so here it is the newest single off dramora's debut ep awakening this one's called home Yeah, I was I was at a loss. I mean, I, I was listening to it, in fact, on the way here again. And I'm like, God, there's just so many. Every time you listen, there's so many new elements. I mean, did, was that a conscious thing or did you basically just say, this is just what came to my mind and I'm going to put all these pieces together? Or do you map out your ideas and songs sonically when you're writing them? I don't know. Um, I know that um, I've never, I've never thought of myself as a careful planner when it comes to composing anything because I don't I just don't think of things like that like I know I've been around a lot of really fucking great songwriters right not metal people but, <laughs> but people who and not not say that metal doesn't have great songwriting but right say, these people I knew were more writing songs for them to be like sang um, as like a beautiful three chords on purpose, like three chords and the vocal melody was purposefully like taken out of like theory 
type elements, you know? Sure. Um, so that then when the, those two things cross paths, they did something that they heard somewhere else. And then, oh, I really wanted to have a bridge like this. And I really, you know, so on and so forth. Very specific compositional elements. And one of those people works in Nashville now. So um, he is a songwriter. So that being said, I believe that that type of songwriting needs to exist because first of all, it's fucking popular and it keeps music at the forefront of an entertainment business that is fucking now flooded with all kinds of other stuff. And it creates, you know, an importance to music that I feel is really important. And for our type of music to exist, pop music has to exist. It's just the fucking way things work. But I think yeah, those yin people, and yang, right? they're purposefully going for something when they write those songs and they're so fucking good at it. So surgical. They could write a song that would make you cry and they didn't feel a feeling. They were just like, I know that if I do this, this happens because they've put it through the ringer so many times they know it's a formula. I don't have that. Like, I just can't even think like that. So like uh, the song I'm writing last night, that's for the new album. There's already a few songs written and they've all sort of had the same thing where I just had a riff and it's like, could be a soft thing or something, or maybe a lead line or something. I'm just I continuing to play it when I'm sitting down on the couch or something. That's usually it. And then I'll bring it up here and I'll put it in there and I'll start surrounding it with things. And then, I don't know, it just starts to come together. Once the song is, once I've done that for a few hours and just like, you know, <laughs> put a Dramora song together, which is just a fucking mess of <laughs> things, you know, um, it's just like it in uh I'll start to like play through it and just be like, okay, I really, you know, I'll start to feel like it should get, you know, heavier or, or whatever. Like it's just saying like, kind of give you an idea. There's really no method or anything. It's just kind of like, I don't know. I, I just, however I'm feeling at that point. And then the lyrics usually just like, I'll start to write something. And then I don't know. I just like, um, I sort of do the, the melody or whatever. You know, it's so like, you hear it in your head and then the words kind of come after you hear the melody. I think it's more subconscious than it yeah. is conscious. You know, like you ever feel like that? You ever written any lyrics where you're just kind of like, and I want it or something like that. And then you just have to sort of figure out the other lyrics. You yeah. Know? Like I can always feel like there's a few words in there I'd like to touch on. But so, yeah, I mean, there's nothing in there that uh, that is like really. I'm really going for anything. And you can tell by listening to each one of the songs that I felt very differently probably at each time yeah. that I wrote something. But there's similarities to each one of them, I think. There is. And and I think also it's probably important to note that, as you mentioned, so you're a drummer, mm -hmm. but you also play guitar and you also sing. And so you've been able to kind of work all of the elements and a lot of times songwriting is approached it starts by one person who plays this instrument and then the song is based around the fact that that's what that person knows right and you've come from the perspective of being behind the kit and then also taking up a guitar but not approaching it like well i have to prove that i can play this kind of music you're like you're a metal drummer and you're a metal guitarist and you're a metal vocalist you take all of these different influences and all of these instruments, which I think is probably what lends to your sound being so unique. And it, uh, there's been a couple people are very critical of it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there was one dude in particular, and uh, I don't even remember his name, but it was just like, it was just fucking slam. <laughs> everything, I, I fuck it, everything about me, it was just like knifing me, you know? Yeah. It was like, this, haters gonna hate. Yeah, right? this has no direction. Why is it, why is it all of a sudden have this poppy part? Why, why is it, uh, it's like it should just stick to one thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I, it's basically, if you don't like clean vocals, some of these songs are going to fucking grind at you. It's going to be like nails on a chalkboard. And I understand that. Because sure. I've sort of done a thing that I sort of think is not a recipe for, for success in all realms. And I think that thing is that Taylor is an amazing vocalist. But if you like Taylor's vocals, there's a chance you're probably not going to like clean singing. And then I think there people have told me that they fucking love my voice. Yeah. And then I think if you like my voice, there's a good chance you might not like Taylor's vocals, but there's a lot of people who like the break from each other as they intertwine because there's a lot of people who have singing in the songs, but it's like a, 
like a whiny skateboard singer and then <laughs> like a hardcore vocalist, you know, and like that's the recipe that's been around for like a million years. Yeah. And it's got that kind of like whininess to the clean vocals. And then it's got like a not very death metal side to the other side. And yeah. I that's a turnoff for me. Like I like good singing and, and I can appreciate all music for what it's what it is, you know, and uh, I wouldn't fucking dog on anybody for putting any effort in anything that they believed in. But for a lot of people, I think it's just kind of tired. It's like, okay, we get it. That's already been done. Kill switch fucking aced it a yeah. long time ago. Fucking It's hard to it's hard to come up with a new idea. Because there's that that element of, well, I don't want to be derivative, so I, I can't just like say I want to be like this band, right? So, but I want to be different enough and not alienate <laughs> the people that like a style, quote unquote, of music. It's a it's a tough it's a tough call where to where to take a direction. You know, to be original it takes some balls. I mean, my wife and I always talk about like the movie industry. They're just fucking remaking movies, just remakes and Quite remakes literally. and remakes. Literally, yeah. I mean, I can look back to um, you know uh, Gus Van Sant deciding that he wanted to remake shot by shot psycho and i'm like why the fuck would you do that and then there's bands out there that like oh i really like you know band x y and z you know and they're like that's great but you literally stole the rhythm section you do the same vocals you do the same guitar phrases you're doing the same crazy tremolo based guitar solos so i'm like what makes you different why am i gonna give you money when I can just go listen to these bands. So even if you don't always agree with the elements of an original band, you can at least respect the fact that they've got the balls to try to do something different. Well, a lot of people don't realize, you know, that are younger that don't, you know, they listen to fucking all these bands. Now, you know, I don't agree with everything Pantera stood for. So let's just go there. I'm with you. Confederate flags and all that shit. Right. I didn't really fucking recognize that was a bullshit move at the time because I was a kid and I don't know. It just wasn't. No one was like fucking scrutinizing it. Right. I see now that that's a big fucking problem. Yeah, for sure. And I would probably not have aligned myself with it at that point. You know, I just didn't get it. Um, I just thought it was just a fucking flag. I didn't know. Now I know that it's very much <laughs> a piece of shit thing to put a fucking Confederate flag on your guitar. So just for anyone who's like, fuck you for listening to Pantera. But when I was a kid, Pantera was a fucking humongous band and yeah. everyone listened to them and everyone wanted to be Dimebag and everyone wanted to be Vinnie Paul. Yeah. Everyone wanted to be Phil and Selwyn. Everyone wanted to be Rex Brown and everyone knew all four of those guys very, very well and their con- contributions, right? And so everyone who started to scream, they wanted to be Phil. And everyone who started to play guitar, they wanted to be Dimebag. And I think the reason that it was an, it's important for me to note that is because there is not a lot of that right now. There's not a lot of personalities out there in our realm that are that fucking big. Yeah. Like that star power that people used to have, it just doesn't exist like it used to. And it's not because you're like... If your plan to get famous is to get really good at the guitar, that's a shitty plan. And I'm sorry... Because there's so many people who are good at the guitar. There's so much more to it. There's like something about Dimebag Daryl yeah. was energizing to watch him do what he did. And even if you couldn't see him, you, there was just something about it. I can't even really tell you what it was. But the riffs were insane. And the his picking hand was insane. And the way he played those riffs was insane. I hear it in almost every song. Yeah. Because I was around when it was popular. I now hear it in all this stuff, but if you weren't around for them and they weren't around after like the year 2000, so that could be fucking anybody. Right. You know, like, fuck, that could be, you know, even five years before that, you would have been a fucking baby. So honestly, like anyone from like 1995 on, you might not even know shit about Pantera and but right. you, you just don't know that everyone fucking copped that band they copped the drumming the breakdowns the fucking vocals the lyrical style everything about that band is in every band now when i went to go do what i'm doing i didn't try to avoid that or anything but i can tell you that a lot of what i i see as a problem with originality now is that people are trying to sidestep other things to be original um and I think that originality doesn't really come from playing different notes or playing like a different passage or choosing like a different chord structure. Originality is like the way it sounds, the way it's presented. I don't know, man, because Pantera wasn't doing something that much fucking different than Slayer did or that 
Metallica did Well, didn't. Pantera also started out playing a completely different kind of glam music. Metal, yeah, yeah, they were super glam. They were, and they, you know, it, everything, everything about them was different. And then one day, they just had a, you know, fucking formula switch, a paradigm shift. Right. <laughs> and, and, and it is what it is, you know. But yeah, I, I, I think absolutely there's that in today's music, there's a lot of stellar musicians and a lot of stellar bands, but you don't hear. You know, like, this person is the new this person. You just no. don't hear a lot of that. You know, for me back in the day, it was James Murphy and Chuck Schuldiner. No, Chuck those, Schuldiner. those were the guys that, that I was like when I was learning to play guitar. Uh, you know, Chuck had that very precise technique, and he, he was like, I want to have these vocals that stand out. I'm going to sing death metal, but I want you to understand the words that I'm saying and you know he did vocal warm ups and you know of course there was that whole time where death metal kind of became the uh, a whole new genre if you will so yeah I, I, I agree there's just that lack of of people that people are really being drawn to of the we'll call it the the new guard right the new well, regime that, and like, like I was saying like the personality yeah I'm using there's a, some showmanship that also has to be involved. I agree. And, yeah. the, and the star power. Yeah. You know, like it's just something some people have and some people just don't fucking yeah. have. I've seen tons of guitarists and tons of vocalists up there that are like really good singers or really good guitarists. But you watch them play like on a live show and you're like, dude, fucking move or do something, something. like just just I don't know, fucking pull down your pants or something. Right. <laughs> right. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, they're just our ideals of what is good is different, but yeah. I agree with you. I think like it's something you can't really fake either. So it's obvious when someone's like trying to act like a fucking live performer that's going crazy and they're not. And you can tell that, that way. they're a studio <laughs> musician, <laughs> right. you know, and they don't, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, there's people that are amazing in the studio and you listen to the records and you're just like, fuck, that's so good. I'd love to see that live, you know? And then you see it live and you're like, well, I didn't have the same emotional response when I saw it being played as when I heard it being played, you know? And then, you know, there's bands that, you know, they're known for their live shows and their albums are, you know, boring. In fact, and they're so boring that they just play all the songs differently when they play. Counting Crows, prime example. Uh, yeah. They, you know... I'm not a huge fan of them anymore, but back in the day, one of the things I liked about them was the fact that they never played the same song, like, the same way, ever. Yeah. Like, their hits, it doesn't matter. They played it different every fucking time. I think that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And their albums were good, but people went to see them for their live shows. And then you got bands, you know, like I went and saw Fleetwood Mac recently. Um, and sadly, they don't have Lindsey Buckingham anymore, but, you know, whatever. But watching them play is boring as fuck. Wow. I mean, they're really good to listen to, but to watch them is not entertaining at all, oh. you know? And that's why I like to go to metal shows because I like to watch the dudes get up there and, you know, I don't, whatever your shtick is, if you're, you know, carving fucking pentagrams in your chest or, you know, right. whatever. But, you know, I want to see some element of showmanship when I, when I go. So does Dramora, I mean, have you guys had really a chance to play shows? I don't know. I've played a ton of shows with Taylor. So right. I'm just not fucking worried about that, but, um, um, so, and that's the, something I, I guess I'll address right now, but so it's, there was a fourth member and he's just not kind of there anymore. <laughs> um, not kind of there or he's just gone. He's gone. He, okay. had, he had some problems and he was never, he didn't record anything on the album and he didn't write any of the songs. Okay. But, you know, I felt confident enough about him being, you know, the fourth member that, uh, he ended up in the pictures and stuff like that. Okay. And, uh, we're still friends. It's nothing like that. It just... It's a monetary thing. He was having some issues like that. And there, there were some other issues going on in his life that were not going to allow him to, I think, go on tour. And it's going to limit his contributional it capabilities. Gonna, well, it was going to, yeah, none of that, but limit Dramora a lot. Okay. So I was like, okay, I don't want that. This is, I want to do this, do this. Like, I want to fucking make a living being a musician. Like, yeah. we all want that here. All three of the people that are here. Me and Jared and Taylor. It's a dedication level. We're gone. Like, we're going to go work this thing. And if we can just play music and we only make thirty five to 40000 a year, we're totally fucking fine with that. Yeah. I just don't want to work at Comcast anymore. And, <laughs> you know, Jared doesn't work and work at the fucking AV place anymore. We're, we're fucking done, man. Yeah. I, well, you know, it's like we realize we're all good enough to just, we could be a touring act just fine. 
I'm, I'm not looking to become fucking Slipknot. That would be amazing. But right. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for a realistic goal, which is to make a living doing this. And uh, he was not, he's not, uh, I don't think he had that in mind. I think he said he did. I think as it got closer to it being a reality. And once this band started to get as much attention as it did, I think that that was also a thing like, whoa, Terry wasn't fucking around. Like, yeah. I'm not. I'm definitely not fucking around here. I'm, this is going out. So we've played together a lot, and there's a lot of energy. We uh, we have a touring bass player coming with us. His uh, he a is from touring one... bass player, though not necessarily a quote unquote member of the band. Well, now we're being real careful. Okay. Okay. So yeah, if so, there's two people. One of them is my friend Nick. He is the bass player in Blood and Thunder, and he is extremely beyond competent to be in this fucking band by a fucking long shot. Not to mention that he has the sound that this band needs. He plays dingwall basses. He uses a dark glass head. He's got the fingers of death. He loves the band and likes all the songs and he already fucking knows them all. And I was just like, hey. Did he get the Nolly signature dingwall? Because I have a friend of mine. That oh, he's got like five. Yeah. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a nut and he's got way too many. But yeah, obviously everyone's into those bases. Yeah. Of fucking Nolly. But no, so he sounds right and he's a friend and he's so chill and he'll be so cool to go on tour with, right? So yeah. um, there is another person that's in the running for the same position. I just need to hear him play some more. And I want to, I was trying to get like a, like a, I don't know, like a pregame show before the tour, or a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. I know Nick will be fine. He's played a hundred shows. I've played with Blood and Thunder. Like I don't even know how many fucking times. It's sure. A Seattle band, but um, we've shared the stage with him so much. I'm not worried about Nick. This other guy, I'm not going to name. Um, I haven't. He does want the part as a permanent position. He's got killer vocals. He can sing and he can do harsh vocals and he can sing and play uh, bass. Um, and he's similarly has the same gear and sounds as good. Uh, those are big things to me. Like, you know, yeah. for someone to come in here, we had a bunch of second guitar players, um, like two or three or something like that come in. None of them sounded like they were supposed to like, I don't know. Like I like they with would them. tell you what they sound like and then you hear it and you're like, no dude, I'm going to jam with them out of, out of place with like a practice amp or something. Be like, Oh, I guess, you know, we'll see what you sound like when you come play the song. So you've got to get someone, first of all, invested enough to learn a few songs. That's sure. difficult enough. Then they show up and it's just like, you know, I have a very, I wouldn't say it's like modern, but I have a certain aesthetic to my guitar sound. It's very like, it sounds like a rectifier for sure. Like if you know anything about guitar amps, that's, it sounds like a Mesa rectifier. It and, really does. Uh, what, what are you, are you tuning to like B or C? It's in drop A. Drop A. And then the other one is a and it's drop C with the A is dropped or the, the C is dropped to an A. Yeah. So those are two tunings. So that's as low as a 25 and a half will go. With, just, without going full baritone or. Well, no, the 25 and a half inch neck, yeah. you cannot intonate it lower than A. It just won't fucking do it. It won't do it. Your strings will be flopping around. No, and... <laughs> it's uh, so the intonation, if you uh, compared it to the 12th fret on the guitar, it'll yeah. be flat. So if you try to play a chord, on like the eighth fret, yeah, the guitar won't allow you to stretch out the scale any longer, so you'd have to get a longer neck. Yeah, and I do plan on that for future stuff, but yeah, this is as low, and I don't like I want to play a seven string or an eight string. Or yeah, whatever. I just don't. I'm not. I don't know why. It's it's not like I have anything against them or anything. Yeah. It's just I like looking at the six strings. <laughs> I've been doing it since I was 15. Yeah, it's it's the it's the like home you style. Said, I primarily play riffs. I'm not fucking out there shredding down. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. It's it's the uh, the guitar equivalent of a uh, you know down home cooking. You just you're familiar with it. You yeah. know it well. And, and yeah, the sound your guitar sound is it's very tight. It's very. Um, it, I mean, I'm a rectifier guy myself, so I mean, I could definitely either identify the rectifier or something resembling a rectifier. But uh, yeah, I mean, I noticed that I, I kept going back to that carcass uh, comparison because I'm like, ah, that guitar tone, man, it's just so it's so fucking tight. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. But yeah, getting people to come on board that are okay with trying to match that sound in some way is they don't tough. want to. Yeah, they always want to come. They with want their with stuff. their tone. Show up with a fucking Marshall JCM800 or something. I'm just like. 
There's nothing wrong with that amp if you have it and you're listening to this right now or something, but <laughs> that is not the fucking sound I'm looking what for. What Terry's saying is sell your Marshalls and buy, <laughs> buy Maces. Buy Maces, and if Mace is listening... Or get me, a Kemper. Let me, oh, well, you know what? I'm using the Helix right now, Yeah, and um, I didn't want to carry around my prized possessions with me um, just because I didn't want to get them lost. I don't yeah. want someone to fucking steal them or something. That's why I bought that Harley Benton cab. Um, that's like 200 bucks. If someone steals that Helix, I mean, that's a monetary loss. Yeah. I don't want to lose my fucking, I don't know if you ever bought an amp head and it's like cold as ice and doesn't play well. It doesn't play well. Yeah. And then you play one and you're like, holy shit, this is the one. It's just fucking weird. That triple rectifier is older than shit. Yeah. And it is so bouncy and awesome sounding. And usually triple rectifiers are not like that. So that one is just a weird anomaly. It's just broken in. It's well. I think from the day it was made, it was just made that perfect right. Someone has someone was having a good day when they made that motherfucker. Yeah, and the black diamond plate. You just don't see that many of those either. So. I love that amp so much. <laughs> if someone stole that fucker from me, and it's got the old chicken head knobs with the black knob, and it's yeah. just old. I love it. <laughs> and uh, but if someone stole that shit, I'd be fucking heartbroken. You'd cry. And this single rectifier is the same way. People hate the single rectifier. They think it's an ice pick or something. This particular one is the same way. It just compresses really nicely. Yeah. It kills those high mids. And, you know, when you find a good rectifier, they, that's what they do. Like, people hate their high mids. Mine doesn't really have that. I don't even really have to do shit. Once you start chugging on it and playing chords, it sort of, like, limits those areas somehow. And it makes it really great sounding. I think a lot of times people are also afraid to play with different volumes and different settings until they find those. Because, you know, you're, you can't play a triple rectifier on one and get yeah. the tone out of it. I mean, you need to you need to give it some fucking balls to get it going before you hit that growl. So there is a sweet spot on every amp, and which is why sometimes people bitch and moan about when they go to play shows. You know, they go, oh, man, I, I the sound guy wants me to keep it at this level so he can boost it this way, and now I'm not hearing my tone from behind me. Right. And, you know. Well, that was another thing about the Helix, man. You can go direct in. I found, uh, I found an IR, an impulse response on there that is exactly like what i just a would my amp through a microphone yeah just uh over and over i have a 412 downstairs and uh i just wanted that sound when yeah it comes to that 412 i got it almost perfectly exactly the way it sounds uh through a microphone back and forth um and then i set it so now what comes out of what goes to front of house they don't have to put a microphone in the cab yeah so I can have all the stage volume I fucking want. Yeah, it's amazing. That's what I want. I want a monitor that sounds the way I want, <laughs> which is behind me shooting shit into my back. I don't want. Yeah. You know, I don't know, man. It's it's a tough one. So which one of these guitars is your is your main rig? Um, the Mint. I bought those two for this this tour. I bought the the so a Telecaster. Those two Telecasters. I just bought those like a few months ago. With the prospect of, again, um, I don't want someone to steal my other guitars. Right. <laughs> if someone steals those, that will suck ass because I really like them a lot. But yeah. There's no sentimental value. Sure. That's way more important to me. The guitars on the back, those three, I've had those since I was a kid. Yeah. Like, So I don't want someone to take those from me. Plus, I don't know if that white one in the back, that's the nicest one, that Kramer Focus. That's the fucking coolest guitar. I recognize that as soon as I walked in because I had one when I was a kid. I love that guitar and it plays so nice. Yeah. And it stays in tune no matter what you do. Uh, it's got a big crack in the one body. One pickup, one knob. Yep, and that's I, all of my guitars yeah. have one pickup, one it's knob. It's really funny. I, I think Tellys um, are now acceptable in the realm of quote unquote metal, whereas before you'd have never known it. But I'd say in the last 10 years, if you don't see some of these, at least progressive metal bands rock and tellies, they're rock and telly body shapes with, you know, custom pickups and yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy to, to, you know, when you, when I hear your sound, you know, I was wondering, you know, what, what guitar is he playing? Cause I had an idea more or less on what style your, your amp setup was going to be. I was close, a little off, but I was pretty close, but I would have never guessed in a million years that you were rocking tellies or, or really? strats. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's something to, uh, that, but I think I've always loved Stratocasters and Telecasters because I think that, uh, it was just one of those things they nailed yeah. from the fucking first day. I think Leo Fender, he made something that really was so balanced tonally yeah that you could kind of get a bunch of fucking things out of it plus i don't like a les paul and i just don't like the scale length on it i yeah. know that that's a weird 
you know, some people are really po- – that's a polarizing thing, the 24 and 7.5 or the 25 and a half mm-hmm. um, for the standard – uh, at least guitars. I think that the Les Paul weighs a hundred fucking thousand pounds. I don't want to <laughs> fuck my shoulder. If you don't up. get a chambered body anyway, right? And then if you have a chambered body, you're, you're fucking, fucking with the with tone. The tone. Yeah. So I think that they do have a, a more solid kind of tone to them. Uh, and then if you go the route of the Strat, I think that you're losing some of what the Les Paul has in its strengths, which is it's a little bit more bassy because it's a little bit more I don't know resonant or whatever. Yeah, I think that. The Tele is the perfect, like straight down the middle, like either way. The of compromise both. of it both. It is. It's a. It's um, the body. They still don't chamber the fuck out of it. It's got a tiny chamber in the front. If you get one that's like the old ones, right? A tiny chamber in the front. That you have to pack all the electronics into, and it's like I'd say the size of like if you put two pens next to each other. It's so small, and the rest of it's solid. So the body <laughs> is solid. And then um, the neck is still really fucking thick compared to a lot of necks, but it's not thick in a way where it's like a brick. It's like very resonant. You can he- you can feel all the notes you're playing, even if the amp isn't plugged in. You can feel them like kind of resonating through your arm and stuff like that. Yeah, I like that, and I think that I'm not the only one. Obviously, I think it's a popular guitar because it looks very. Like anybody could play it, any style. I think at this point, and it fits really nicely on you. It doesn't. You know, the it's headstock good balance, doesn't yeah. fall, and it's not going to kill you with your neck. You could also sit down and play it really nice. And, you know, I could, you know. Unlike I, with my V that I play. That I is, played a V for a long time, <laughs> actually. I used to have yeah. uh, the, the Dimebag thing. I, I didn't want to be like him and, like, have people like, oh, you just want to be Dimebag. So I got, like, the V version of what he had. <laughs> yeah. And for a long time, yeah, you put it between your... Yeah, it's got to prop it up this way. And once you get used to it, it's fine. But, you know, I, I kind of like to lean them down, but... I guess I just I don't know I can't play my V sitting down comfortably. I kind of had still. a problem with it nose diving on yeah. all the time on uh, like if you played it on the stage or something like the same with like uh, the ML doesn't seem like it would be that way but it was the same it had like a lot of weight because the headstock was so fucking big <laughs> <laughs> and how many headstocks did I fucking chip or break or I put, know you know dings in people's walls or ceilings taking the guitar off walking it around yeah Jesus Christ what a <laughs> fucking monster amount of wood yeah yeah it's crazy I, yeah, I, yeah the Telecaster is cool I like it I'd like to get a baritone version or a couple of baritone versions of it but those will work for now yeah no man well your sound sa- your sound is definitely tight um I, I I definitely it's a good mix I mean it's it's like I said, we've identified that there's a million different kind of influences and sounds and, and blends of sounds uh, within your band. You know, when people ask you, what kind of music is Dramora? Like, wh- what do you tell them? We're sticking with melodic death metal. I love it. Because yeah. I can't really think of another way to say it without it just being a fucking conversation. And not that I don't want to have conversations with people. If you want to fucking talk about it, it's fine. But if you're just trying to get a straight up answer of what I think it is, I think it's like, I think of, when I think about drum I think about bands like, uh, scar symmetry and, uh, maybe later Opeth and God, fucking Opeth. Right. Uh, I think, you know, and not comparing myself to that band at all, but you know, if I'm trying to think of what in the vein it is that, and, um, you know, stuff that's not afraid to kind of stretch some boundaries, but also like there's obviously a strong influence of death metal, very yeah. strong influence of metal in there. Definitely that stuff is very prominent. At the same time, man, I had so many phases when I was growing up. There was a summer or two when I listened to like Jack Johnson <laughs> and fucking smoked weed and went all these parties. And I just was hanging out with people who were listening to that. And there yeah. was like whole years where I listened to like gangster rap uh, there was a whole, like there was at one point I got really into Bjork. I'm, I don't know. There's, there's been like a, I've went through so many phases over the years. It's like, it's hard for me to sit down and write a piece of music and that stuff not be like, Oh, you know, it'd be really fucking cool if I, <laughs> if I did this part with, you know, and I start singing a part with a, another part, you know, and uh, I can, I can feel like the little sparks and stuff flying in right. my head, like, Oh, this should go in this direction. And I start playing that, you know, and it feels good to me. And I think that's the most important part is not that I'm trying to be like, will people listen to this? Oh, I better fucking not do this. Cause, cause I think when you do that, um, that's a, that's a, that's going to give you a, a pretty shallow ceiling. 
I think anybody who's doing that, who is worried, unless you're going to do what Nashville guy did, uh, did and like, it's going to be your fucking life's journey <laughs> to figure out the exact <laughs> things that move people and continue to do them over and over and over and over and over. And you're, and instead of doing that, your life's journey as a musician is to fulfill yourself by writing things that make you feel good. Because usually, if you're even anywhere closely aligned with other humans on the earth, with I feel like I am, other people, not everyone, but other people are going to listen to and go, ah, oh, I like this, you know, this is, this is cool, or it's got a good vibe, or, you know. So, like, it's, it's, you run the risk of becoming really contrived and disingenuous every time that you start to make decisions based on your insecurities. Mm -hmm. And insecurities are prominent in every human being. It's what we use to, like you know, talk to people. It's how we judge how we should treat other people. Like if they're having a hard time, it's our way to be sensitive to them right? and stuff like that. There's so much there. But when you go to write something that's going to be pure and creative and especially a piece of music, I think that you fucking leave all that at the fucking door. Yeah. Don't do anything that you don't think is fucking cool because you think that other people won't think it's cool. That's a recipe for fucking disaster in the end because you can't keep that up any fucking ways. What's going to happen when it's not cool in fucking five years? You're going to change then too. Right. You know, what's going to happen in five years after that? You're going to change then too. Just do what you think is fucking cool. Stop worrying so much about yeah. everyone else. I think that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, I think we all, I mean, I, I'm guilty of this where I, I feel the need like I need to identify it. Like, what what is this? How do I classify this? What 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 group do I put this in? Like, Because I need m my mental well-being needs me to be able to to put it in a home and a band like Dramora I think is probably going to have different elements introduced L looking at the progression of your songs just on a five song work I can imagine a full length from you would have probably even more elements to it I think it. that actually listening to it it's uh I personally think it's less eclectic but yeah. that's not on purpose I think that when I wrote that album or those particular five songs um and the lyrics and everything and the final touches and the way it was all put together, there's a lot of like, you know, lyrics about substance abuse and emotional problems. And, and now that I'm writing this particular album, there's a whole different slew of things going on. And so if every time I put something together and it gets finished, um, like I had to, there's going to be three songs we play live that are not on the EP because obviously we have to have more than fucking 17 music minutes of music <laughs> to go on a tour. So there's like, we're going to do a cover sure, and we're going to do three or four Is songs. Is that a Deftones cover? Um, we're, yeah. That you've been working just, on? I'm tightening up the ends of it, getting a, a yeah. real mix so that it's presentable. But yeah, we're going to do Minerva. Sick. I want to do that song really, really bad. And I think that, uh, I think it's just a great song all around. And, dude, metal people love the Deftones. I personally do. I also like the Deftones in the sense that if you hear the word Deftones, like, and you're just out there in the world, you go, oh, Deftones. Oh, Deftones, they sound like they probably got some pretty good tones. You know, what kind of, <laughs> what kind of band is Deftones? And then you turn on Deftones and you fucking hear those guitars and you're just like, oh, my God, where right. did that name come from? Because, yeah, those tones are fucking deaf. But, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's right. a band that, that I just right out the gate with that name, they, they kind of fuck with your perception speaking of names dramora what what is that is that is that a does that come from something um yeah so in the beginning of coming up with this dude me and jared and that's even so right before all of this came about and it just turned out to be us three now there was a two other dudes who were going to be in the band one was going to be the vocalist and i won't name him but that didn't work out and we were coming up with names and it was like they all had these dumb, I don't know, we were just were having a hard fucking time coming up with something. <laughs> they had the music and everything, but it was like, I think there was like blood this and blood that and death this. Right. And, you know, uh, we were doing like the whole adjective, the verb, you know, like entering in fucking names for that. And it was just like, I couldn't come up with anything. I really love the Elder Scrolls games. Okay, I was wondering. Right, and I know yeah. that you had mentioned that you're also like a Bethesda fan on yeah. the way in here. Um, and... Um, so Dramora is like a Daedric servant. Right. And they like carry out orders for the Daedra, you know, kill or inspire or guide or whatever the fuck it is. And uh, that they're going to do in the game. And they have kind of different roles in each one of the chapters, uh, most notably in Skyrim, which is probably the most familiar game to everybody. You know, they're in that a lot. Yeah. And Dramora, you know, that's kind of, you know, seemed like a really good way to 
you know, without saying like muse or something like that. It's a, it's a, it's kind of like an interesting way to put it. It's like, this is like my vessel. Right. To show everyone my insides, you know, or to carry out my fucking vision. That's exactly what it is. Right. So I think it, for more, it makes sense. Um, but then on the same sense, it really just came from our love of fucking video games. Yeah. <laughs> really, I love – and, you know, a lot of the music is very inspired by a lot of those soundtracks. And uh, the art on the front of the cover, it was – came from like, you know, as you feel like passed through like a gateway or something. Yeah. Two big statues. You know, like this whole thing sort of has been inspired by video games when one way or another just because, God, be a liar to say that you're not, uh, you know – sort of everyone at this point who writes music to be inspired by some kind of video game. Oh yeah. The music in video games is fucking awesome. <laughs> uh, there's the, the production that goes into the gaming industry is in a lot of ways surpassed budgets for films. I mean, they're, they're using full orchestral scores with, yeah. you know, major symphonies and you've got, you know, major players in in the film industry writing, you know, uh soundtracks for games and and you know voice actors, you know, just everything about the game industry I think is cool because it's it's a way to support creativity, it's a way, you know, open-ended games like well just Skyrim or, you know, Fallout or whatever, but you kind of play those games as you want, right? They're completely totally. customizable experiences. Imagine without the music and Fallout Oh yeah, because you did you ever play a Fallout One or Fallout Two? I played the originals. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, so I have no idea. And the the, the soundtracks on those I are went forgettable. Backwards. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I went and I played Fallout Three on someone's suggestion, and I was fucking captivated. Yeah, from the very beginning with the narrator and that fucking chord change that. Uh, nah, yeah, dude. I was like, oh, this is, it's so cool. And then the way everything kind of like is so cohesive together, the yeah. the look, the way it looks, the character's choice, everything about that game is amazing. But I think it all starts with that fucking soundtrack. Yeah. And without it, I think the game would be shit, even though there's a lot of times there is no music. The music that is in there is really, really fucking important. I'm somebody that like, if I watch a movie or I play a game or I'm out doing something and then I feel music coming on, I, I go, my body says something's about to happen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm mean, some, something's, something's going on, you know? And like, I can identify, like I'll watch a movie and I mean, you go back, like I'm, I'm a huge fucking star Wars dork, you know, back in the day. So, I mean, you know, you hear the star Wars theme songs and you know, the songs of the characters, right? Because yeah. even if they play them in a different pitch or they play them at a different speed or they play them with a, you know, different kind of timbres. You still know it's the same song and you still know Darth Vader's coming up on the screen or Princess Leia is coming up on the screen or, you know, this and that. So I, I, music is a character as far as I'm yeah, concerned in, in games. And so, you know, I, it's as far as how it ties into, I think a lot of bands, yeah, bands use, you know, gaming, whether or not it's video games or tabletops or, you know, whatever, but as kind of a form of escape and, you know, a band like Bolt Thrower that, that took their early inspiration yeah, from like, you know, the 40K and stuff like that, you know, all of the games workshop stuff was pretty much the inspiration for almost all of the Bolt Thrower material up, up until like Fourth Crusade. But, you know, and then it was just like you listen to the lyrics and you wouldn't know they're talking about games or fictional characters. Yeah. You just think, wow, this guy fucking likes his history and he likes war and shit like that. You're like, no, man, I play tabletop. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> it's you know, fucking it's, cool. Uh, and that's a really good point. Like, I think that I'm making that point as if it's like a modern thing, but I think it's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think that music and movies and soundtracks really influenced a lot of people back in the day as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah... It, well, escapism, right? It's true. It, it is is kind of a, a source of inspiration for a lot of artists, and you know the the struggling artist image you have of the tortured soul who's got things in his body he needs to get <laughs> out. Right? right yeah. That's how musicians are, and then I think a lot of them get inspired by seeing something in an element that's that's kind of creative, and they latch onto it. And they go, "Oh, I could fucking do something with that." I think most people too, especially people who are really involved with music or have been drawn to it. For the exact reason that it evokes emotions on its own. Oh, yeah. Like you just listen to something and it starts to make you feel sad or you just listen to something that starts to make you feel like powerful and strong. I think that 
it's way more uh, powerful than some people give it credit for. And then at the same time, we try to avoid that a lot by saying, oh, he didn't kill himself because he listened to this or <laughs> he didn't do this because of this. Yeah. You know, he was listening to this because he was fucked up. I don't know what the answer is. On yeah. That. Chicken or the egg, right? It doesn't matter, though, because you can't fucking censor art. Whatever yeah. happens with that's not your fucking decision. I'm just saying and I would never condone someone being able to take away music or stop someone from doing a type of music because of its maybe possible consequences um, because that would be terrible. Right. But uh, I do believe that some music can create uh, people. I think yeah. in the end, you know, I didn't search out metal. I was... Uh, You're drawn to it. I listened to, when I was a kid, you know, I mean, I listened to a lot of Foo Fighters and Nirvana and uh, fucking Soundgarden and we were really into punk rock, like really, really, really into punk rock. Um, and then, I, you know, Metallica, nothing really too fucking serious. And I think, you know, once someone showed me Cannibal Corpse, I was like, okay, then all this other music is just yeah. wimpy. Like, <laughs> it was. It was just like, you know, I, I've, I've actually, you know, obviously come full circle and I have so much more respect for that music than I ever have in my entire life because I realized how fucking important it is. Yeah. But, yeah, when I, when I started going down that rabbit hole, I remember I found Macabre. You know that band mm -hmm. is? That's that album, Dahmer. Yeah. Oh, my God. The <laughs> drums and the lyrical content and the fucking just the chugs and stuff. It's just like, geez, these guys are nuts, dude. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, then it was like In Flames. And, I mean, this is like early 2000s. So, like, a fl In Flames soil work was a humongous influence on me, especially like Stabbing the Drama, Predator's Portrait those kinds of albums so yeah you're you're you and i are talking here face to face and I, i'm realizing you're bringing out all these names and i'm like yeah those are great bands and i realize there's a generational difference between yeah. between you and i because you know um i'm 45 and so when i was getting into the heavier sound of things cannibal had just released butchered at birth right that was their newest release when that's i first heard cannibal too. yeah as the barnes era so um you know corpse was still doing monstrosity you know and so the the the, the extreme bands out there of course cannibal was always kind of one of the most extreme bands out there not only just from their lyrical content but you know the imagery that they had on their albums those and were, fucking riffs though yeah dude those on their own <laughs> talk about rectifier but uh yeah you know those that stuff in like pungent stench and autopsy and those early bands that, that really kind of that whole thing with the imagery like we talked about earlier you're trying to kind of create this this sense of identity but i, I keep going back to cannibal um for that first introduction to the really 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 extreme stuff and then on the flip side of that was also like deicide because deicide was satanic for the sake of being satanic i never really got into deicide yeah. i remember someone showing me and it was like a later album mm -hmm. i just thought like what is the big deal? Yeah, no, they, they got really, really, really terrible. But the first album was, it was along the same lines because it was just so shocking. It was just so like, wow. I mean, I've heard satanic stuff before and I've heard evil stuff before, <laughs> but like these guys are taking it to like the next level and then some. So yeah, but I, I it's, it's kind of cool to hear you talk about these bands that were influencing you. And it makes me think back to, you know, the scene was kind of still forming, I think. Well, I, I hear I a lot into of it. soil work and in flames and nevermore in oh, my music. You just hit, I, like, hear, I hear it in my music when I listen to it. Maybe other people don't, but I hear the parts that yeah. I picked out of those bands that I think are like telltale signs that I listen to them too much. Like I can tell that there's some choruses that are like, that's a soil work song. And I'm like, <laughs> that's an in flames part. And that's a nevermore breakdown. And yeah. those like the riffs and the drum parts and how they have been like cohesively put together. I feel like I, that's who I can tell who uh, in the end won my heart even though i don't know it sometimes yeah i can tell like i love european fucking mellow death it's just i love it i don't yeah. know and i still listen to it now and some of it just still holds up so fucking well you know you but, uh, uh you hit a soft spot with me with nevermore because um and you know i'm a i'm a huge jeff loomis fan although you, you know <laughs> jeff loomis clearly not really from here but kind of became like an adopted son of Seattle, if you will. I would say his work with World Dane and writing a whole album in Queen Anne, I'd say was 
That's enough to, to make him a Seattle yeah, yeah. to me. Yeah, absolutely. He still lives in Shoreline, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually ran into him at an Exhorter show. Oh, cool. Um, you know, a, f- uh, a few months back. Um, and he was just hanging out, you know. It's just like, hey, what's up? He's like, hey, dude. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's really cool. that the, the Seattle scene, you know, which, again, was one of the things that kind of drew me to you and a, a, a shout out to, uh, to John Asher for, for kind of hooking this up and everything. But, um, he was like, Hey, aren't you out in the Seattle area? You know, check these guys out. And I'm like, well, this is really cool because the Seattle quote unquote metal scene has kind of not really been a thing for a long time. And nevermore is really to me, the band that as things kind of started trailing away and getting more into like the grunge territory and that kind of hiatus time frame in the late 90s early 2000s i kept going back to like nevermore and queensrike for the metal elements although there was plenty of other bands out there like faustus and stuff but um you guys now i think are part of a movement that's really bringing seattle metal back on the map i fucking hope so I, I so that because that was, it's fucking dead. In that's the my that was my question is you know what's your stance? I don't know stance. That's a bad word, but what's your thoughts on where the Seattle metal scene is? Who's out there? Who's doing it right? And what do we need to do to put Seattle back on the map for metal? I think that it's we've had such an ebb and flow with this place because we're up in this corner of the United States. And even with the way information travels now, it still doesn't fucking matter. Like it's a weird fucking place, man. It really is. And I think, uh, it's got this never ending gloom that also brings us to the most, some of the most wonderful summers you'll ever see in your life. The greenest, it's like fucking God's country out here for like four months or something. Right. And then the rest of the year, it's just low hanging clouds <laughs> that are pissing on you. And it kind of like today, <laughs> it may, I don't think that it's a place that uh, evokes a lot of, you know, metal type emotions, to be totally honest. I think that grunge and, uh, you know, when people think of grunge, they, you know, depending on your age, I think you might think Nirvana. And that's not what grunge is to me. Grunge to me is like uh, Mud Honey and Mud Honey, Green, Green River, Willard, right? Um, um, you know, go ahead, Grunt, Tad. Grunt Fuck. Tad. I was just listening to Tad, uh, Eight Way Santa, the other day, you know, and a lot of those bands, <laughs> Jack, help me, Jack Pepsi, the Melvins, you know, back there was in like the day. Seaweed. Yeah. Um, dude, there was, there's been a ton of bands, and, and it was, um, I've watched so many documentaries. I was a little kid when yeah. that was going on, so I didn't really get to be there for it happening. But it was kind of like important for my family to show me what the fuck was really going on. And as I learned, you know, this place was a place that no one came to because there was no scene. And so the local people here, they made the bands that sprung that happening. You know, there was a couple bands. It was Queensryche. Mm-hmm. It was a couple famous bands and nothing really. Metal and- Church. Metal Church. Sanctuary pre pre Nevermore. Right. So I mean, but yeah. I mean there's there's a few, man, for sure. But it uh there was nothing, you know, and so all the locals, you know, to have bands that would come through because no one came through, they just started putting on their own shows. And so then that sprouted there's obviously gonna be some winners in the middle of the out the crappy locals, and that's where we got like Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and fucking Mud Honey and, and Nirvana was in there somewhere. And Mother Love Bone. Yeah, the Melvins and Melvins. shit like that, dude. All these great fucking artists came up out of that, but I think that, that this place is still sort of like that because when I go out and, and uh, well, I did sound, and that gave me a really good eye-opening like fucking epiphany, actually, because I only saw my own perception as we all do. You know, we think what's popular is what we like because we surround ourselves with people who like the same thing. And it yeah. becomes like an echo chamber. We don't really see that, hey, there's a there's a whole other fucking world out here. When I did sound, dude, what's popular around here is doom metal. <laughs> people show up to those shows. Which I love. <laughs> fucking hundreds of people show up to doom metal shows yeah. here in Seattle. And not only that, the, uh, I don't even know what you call it, but folk music. So like, uh, you know, uh what is that band? Uh, it's like a sad hayride kind of fucking uh, like folk metal. You're talking no, about not folk metal, but like folk music. Like oh. it's like uh, indie type music, but not like the indie. I think like when skateboarding was you know, popular, but like, you know, uh, shit, I can't even think of the names of the bands. Something like singer songwriting, like 107.7, the end type. Music. Got it. Yeah. You know, like that shit. And it's just like, they're still playing guitars. They're still singing. There's not like, it's not like it's fake music. It's really good. It's just 
That is popular here. So the metal shows, nobody fucking ever shows up, and I did sound for hundreds of them. So I'm telling you right now, anybody who says that I'm calling bullshit, you are fucking full of shit. <laughs> there's some fucking <laughs> awesome bands playing, yeah, and there's like ten fucking people out there, yeah. And you know, the people who own the bars are just like, can't fucking afford this. Like, yeah. I cannot afford. And it's funny because the bar owner that I worked for was a metalhead. And so he like went out of his way to have bands play there that he knew wouldn't have a fucking audience. But then he'd have to supplement that by having like a rap show and then have like these folk people come. So it's like So what you're saying is the bands are there. Uh, and- no one cares here. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So like Dramora Ugh. and all these bands, you know, for us to play in front of a crowd, you have to play with a national band. So you have to end up playing and I'm not saying have to as like in a chore, I'm saying you're gonna have to end up playing uh, for Dana's club, you know, El Corazon or, or play for one of Tracy's clubs or like Club Sur or something like that around mm-hmm. here in Seattle. That's really the only two big ones. There's a few other Which ones. Which is where I saw Suffocation play. There you go, club because Sur. they like metal. Yeah. So they give it a home for national touring acts that will bring people to the place. Yeah. Then a local ga- band will get to play with them. And that's your chance to get in front of the only people that will probably come out to a metal show. And that's the sad fucking part about this place. Cause it's not like that everywhere. Um, but that's, that's what's going on here. How do you fix that? I don't fucking have any idea. Just, if you want it, man, if you see a show, just go to the fucking show. No, that's not good enough because we've been saying that forever. What yeah. I noticed that metal people don't do and metal promoters don't do, be a doing sound that I noticed that everyone else does, is they actually give a fuck and they spend money on the promotion. So, like, for instance... Promotion is a lost art. If you ever run sound or go to a local rap show, okay... It's a whole different setup. They have a VIP area, a dude who's guarding it. That all takes money, by the way. Right. So someone had to put the money down first. They make a special fucking area. It's got special stuff inside of it, special drinks. It's got special tables. It's got special seating area, a possible, you know, chance to meet the big artist. It's got, and then on, you know, people pay extra for that. That's exclusivity that even metalheads definitely fucking like. We all know that. Then... They have merch at the front door. They sell special drinks that fucking night that are made for that fucking show. There's just, it's everything. So it's an experience. They make an event out of it. They're making an exclusive thing for each thing because they give a fuck and they want it to be a fun thing to come do. I do not see metal shows doing that. Even big bands, I don't see them promoting it that way. It's like, yeah, I just come down, whatever, right on, it's Friday, peace. And then that's the only fucking thing I see. You know what I mean? And it costs yeah. the same fucking money to put that on as it does for to make it fucking really fucking cool. And I think that if we started doing that, and you know what the other thing? The shameless promotion of rap and the folk guys is just, they don't care. They're just like in your face about all of it. There's some kind of like guilt that comes along with being a hardcore or a punk or a metal musician where you don't want anyone to see you trying to make it. Yeah. And I don't know why that fucking exists, but we have to get over that if we're going to have a scene here. Yeah. We have to make people think this is a fucking amazing thing because honestly, it is. If you come to a metal show, if more people came to them, you know, uh, there might be way more people that stick around out of the 100 people who come if 20 people stayed and came back to the next show. We just need to be out there promoting and yeah. not just lazily on Facebook every once in a while going like, I have a show, <laughs> I have a live stream. It's okay. It's like everyone here has serious self-image problems. And sure. I notice it all over the place because they don't, they're afraid to come out and be like, my band's a shit. We did this. It's fucking awesome. But if you ever see just any fucking rapper out there, any rapper from Arlington, Washington, from fucking Bonnie Lake, anything. The real OGs. They're like, my shit's the shit. Come fucking see it. Let's have a hangout. I'm playing here tonight. I'm going to go hang out with these people. I'll be here. They're trying to make themselves accessible. They're trying to make their personality the fucking brand. They want people to be their friends because you know what? That's who shows up to your shows. People who think that they can be friends with us. And that brings me full circle back to Dimebag. Yeah. Why do people like Dimebag, Daryl? Because they thought that they could be his friend. That's a person they felt that he was accessible. I think that's why Phil and Selma was so famous i think that's why those people that become famous i think it's because when you look at him you go like that's the coolest fucking guy at a party yeah that's the guy who's getting all the fucking chicks that's the they just that's what these people do that our artists are not doing and i feel like it's it's a self-image problem it's a fucking 
And I don't know where that comes from. Like I said, it's the guilt of, you know, you don't want someone to think that. It's the same reason why they play so many fucking notes and we all yeah. sweet pick every fucking chance we can. And you know what I mean? So it's you're afraid that people are going to think that you're trying to make it when in reality you are trying to make it. So just give it up. Okay? You don't want to be viewed as a sellout, right? You right. want to be viewed as I'm standing for my own convictions. Well, that being said, then you've theoretically got this tour that may or may not happen, right. but, you know, and you haven't really played cohesively necessarily as a unit enough to really know what's going on. But with all that stuff you just said about interacting with crowds and promoting the shit out of it, like what is Dramora going to be doing to kind of help spearhead that movement then? As soon as I have a chance to get solid dates, I already have another, just like with the album, I've already had the other part of this plan. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be in everyone's faces. You know what I mean? Everywhere that I can make a campaign and make a personalized video. Yeah. That Because I actually give a fuck. Yeah. Well, it sounds totally, like you do. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying is like for all of this stuff, I made sure I went out of my way and wasn't lazy about it. If I couldn't have went out in public and fucking done this, yeah. I would have done it. But there's nothing I could do. But, you know, you got to you got to do as much as you can. And I tried to follow the example of the people who are actually doing this well. I feel like um, I've mentioned Jamie Jostle before. Shameless self-promotion. Absolutely fucking just out of control. Shameless. Like mm -hmm. does not care. Um, I love that about him. And I love that. He believes in his fucking product. He believes in that band. I also believe in Dramora. I also believe that the people in this band are amazing people. And uh, they have a lot of, like, I feel like Taylor has a lot of star power. I don't know if I do or not. We'll fucking see. I feel like he does. Uh, I feel like the the person who might be in the bass might be that, that way. I feel like he is, you know, the potential of those two personalities being big, I think is big. Um, and I think I'm going to fucking use that to my advantage. I want to invite everyone to get to know us while before this tour happens and everything I'm going to be using as much as I can. You know, I don't know if I want to use it that way, but I want to use uh, head PE's fame to get people to let people know who we are. You know, like those people obviously could, those are potential fans of mine and people who also listen to other metal. Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of research and a lot of those people also listen to Gojira. A lot of those people also listen to Metallica. A lot of those people also have some Pantera albums in their fucking CD book. You know what I'm saying? So when it comes down to it, this is a really smart move for me because those are, that's a crossover band. That's a band that, you know, envelopes a lot of different character. And a lot of different people are going to be showing up to that. So every time I play a head PE, PE show, I have the potential to take fans away from there, you know, and also strengthen my bond with the people in head PE and, you know, continue on growing. It's just it's always a slow growth, no matter yeah. how good you are. Metallica had to play shitty little bar bands and fucking play for three beers a night for fucking ever before they got something going. Yeah. It's just the way it is. And I'm prepared for that. But I think the thing that I want to do the most with all this to promote it is, like I said, to to let everyone know that, you know, this isn't just a band with a fucking CD cover. How much of that do you see? I mean, it's insane. It's like yeah. someone just puts out a fucking album and, you know, can't see their face. I don't have any video of them. They don't do any podcasts like we're doing right now. Yeah. No one gets to know who that person is. Um, I feel like if people like me on this podcast or anything else I end up doing, they're probably going to be way more likely to check out to my music. To at least check it out, because yeah. Because I am the same fucking way. Like, I've listened to podcasts where I heard something that I've never even heard of the band name before, and the person was funny. Yeah. <laughs> and they aligned themselves with some stuff that I also liked, and immediately I started looking them up on Spotify yeah. and seeing where they were playing next and stuff like that. That is the that is the most that is the best fucking way to get people to listen to music or come to your show. Yeah. Is like I said, be like these, that's the, like I said, you, you want to follow who's doing it right. These rappers actually get people to come out to their fucking shows, man, because people like them. Yeah. There's a million rap songs out there. Okay. And they're all about the same fucking thing. They like it. Cause that guy did it. Cause he's fucking cool. Cause he talked to me for an hour that one night and we drank and fucking hung out and shit. And, you do that to a fucking thousand people. I've said this before too, and and I think that this is the smartest shit I've heard, ever heard out of come some out of someone's fucking mouth. And I I love uh, Ice T. Um, body body count, cool. motherfucker. He's cool. Yeah, <laughs> I love Body Count, but 
I think I love that dude because he's just a fucking hustler. He's like, he does everything. He's got the fucking TV. He's done music and everything he touches like blows up. Ironically plays a cop. Uh, ironically plays a cop. <laughs> and the cop killer was a very, very popular song by body count. But, um, and also, you know, the adversity in his childhood and everything, the guy's fucking uh, just a, yeah. a success story. Yeah, absolutely. My, so I like to think like that's who you'd want to follow the example of, right? Well, if you've literally listened to him talk about you know, what he thinks you should do in 2020, you should get a thousand diehard fans. Fans, Don't yeah. worry about getting a million likes or trying to get a fucking record deal or any of that sort of shit. If you want to survive and you want to make close to three, you know, six figures a year, you need a thousand fans that will actually come to your show, that will actually buy your fucking thing when you put it out on the internet, that will actually, you know, talk to you online, that will actually share your thing. Because if you had an actual 1,000 people to do that, you wouldn't have to worry about shit for the rest of your fucking life. Yeah, consistent 1,000 people. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And most of the people who are doing this have, you know, honestly about 2,000 to 5,000 people. Even the really big ones, it's about 2,000 to 5,000 people that are like diehard fucking fans. Right. That's the big ones. If you can get 500 to 1,500 somewhere in there, thousands the mark, I'd say. Like that's what he says. That's he says if he could do it all over again, that's all he'd do. He wouldn't have tried to gone give all of his fucking rights and everything to a goddamn record label and because yeah, they sold million albums. What the fuck so does that uh, mean? Yeah, he didn't get any of that money. He didn't get any of that goddamn money and they own everything. So in the end, you know, that's not uh it's not a it's not a plan for longevity. Plan for longevity is to get people who like what you do genuinely, like we talked about before, because if it's genuine you're going to be able to keep doing it. Yeah. It's inside of you. You will be able to recreate that. Not something you just slipped upon and now you're fucking, now people like something you can't do again or something like that. How many yeah. people have done that over the fucking course of history? Countless. Countless, right. Yeah. So do something that's genuine and build a following. I have five today and I got six tomorrow and next week I'll have eight. Okay. We'll just fucking let it grow. Yeah. And keep going. Oh uh, yeah. I always am, am a, a believer in, you know, if you like what I do, just, you know, tell somebody just, you know, just, right. and you got to ask them, Hey, can you do me a favor, man? Can you tell a friend about, you know, this or that? There are a lot of bands out there that I'm like, I'm promoting your band, but you're not promoting your band. Right. You know, it's like, Hey, go see Christian. I fucking love Christian. Those guys are heavy as hell. And I, I promote the shit out of Christian and Christian. If you go see them live, they, they promote themselves throughout the show. They're very gracious, very thankful, and they're big, tough, fucking-looking guys. <laughs> and then they get out there in the crowd, and they're fucking hugging people and saying, thank you, and, hey, come see us again. Bring a friend next time. You yeah, know? dude. It, and it's so simple. It's just those small, simple steps that people just, you know, they're afraid to ask for, hey, man, just let me know what you think. If well, you like it, you know. it's not just that. Like, yeah, I mean, ask people personally yeah. for you know, for, for help. Yeah. Most people just don't know that you actually need the help or that any, you know what I mean? Like most people, it's not a big deal for them to share something or help you with something. No. I'm always doing that. And I don't do it like out of the blue and like demoralize somebody, you know, I think that's another thing that's like, people think, Oh, you know, if you listen to what, you know, we just talked about that you could just contact anybody in the fucking world and ask them for something. That's not the case. <laughs> you need you need to develop relationships with people right. and learn how that works. Because if you don't have a ton of relationships, what I would say is, you know, a lot of with the beds, bedroom artists and stuff like that, I think, you know, you could also be a bedroom artist these days. But you're still going to have to make relationships with people. You're yeah. going to have to interact with the people. Like I said, you only have five right now on your YouTube, right? That's that's nothing wrong with that. That's five people. Right. That could get bigger. You need to praise those five people. Talk to them. Get them to engage with you. Get those five people to share. That's how everyone fucking does this. Right. I think that people just are so caught up in instant gratification that they just can't last long enough to, to make it through anything. Right at the end of Odyssean, we were starting to get big crowds we were starting to play with big bands. Opportunities were going to start fucking happening. That band fell apart. This time around, to kind of answer the question even more, like what am I going to do to promote this tour? I have rock solid people with me. Yeah. So once I start to build, I don't have to let any of those fucking fans go because of conflict of interest. Because I think with the guilt thing I had before with Odyssean was, they did not want to be viewed as someone who wanted to be famous. 
They did not want to be viewed as somebody or a band or a collection of human beings that was trying to do something that would make them famous. Yeah. Because that would make them feel very insecure, like someone was going to make fun of them that they liked. Probably because they'd heard someone making fun of someone for doing that before that they thought was cool. And that's the way all humans fucking work. But yeah, we're going to we're going to promote the living shit out of this as much as I can. I've already done it here yeah. just talking about it I mean, and interact with the fans, you know, fans or friends, you know, call them what you will, but you know, if somebody most of them become friends, Yeah, honestly. that's how I look at it. So, you know, that's that's uh, that's great. So, we've covered a ton of ground <laughs> today, dude. I mean, this is way more than I could have possibly hoped for. So, thanks for for giving up so much of your time to to let me come and kind of invade your studio space. So, if somebody wants to interact with you and they want to get more information about Dramora, and they want to get all the information they can possibly get, where do they find you on the interwebs? How do they get in touch with you and stay up to date with what you guys are doing? Dramora.com. It's D-R-A-E-M-O-R-A. Um, so Dramora.com is the actual website. It is being updated as new things arise. It's got merch. It's got all the fucking dates as they come up. We don't have any tour dates now. I'm still waiting on that. They're just kind of, we're waiting at a distance and seeing what happens. We don't know what'll go on. As soon as that's available, that will be up there in detail. Any videos that are made are up there. All the music is up there. All the links to everything is up there. But um, if you're not into searching through a website, you can find me personally, uh, Terry Leroy Jenkins on Facebook. My band is Dramore. You can obviously go through there. You can interact with me. I, I like, you know, talking to people. So if you uh, just want to look me up on Facebook and friend me, uh, more than welcome to do that. Um, obviously, it would be great if you followed and liked my band. <laughs> uh, I'm also Turlerger <laughs> on um, Instagram. I think if you type in Terrence Leroy Jenkins, it comes up. Um, and then Dramora. And uh, I also have a podcast called the Ultra Nast Podcast. I just had Ryan Fluff Bruce on there. That was a really fucking cool episode. But nice. You can interact with me through that as well. I got all kinds of fucking things, you know. But yeah, those those ones are probably the mainly the main ones to get through. If you guys try to get at Taylor or try to get at Jared, they might answer you. Um, try to encourage them to be more interactive. But you know. And your music, where can they find it? Um. Anywhere you can stream music. It's available, was available yesterday. There is no physical copies available because I just don't know that, you know, I can't even play a show. I just don't see the point in having a CD. I haven't had anybody ask for one. Maybe when the tour pops up. I think it'll be a requirement yeah. to have a little bit of vinyl and a little bit of yeah. CDs. I was actually thinking about doing USB sticks. I've seen people do that. That's a fucking cool one and then you get a free usb stick when you erase the music off of there <laughs> uh so i think that's a, that's got more value than a fucking cd at this point yeah um, and then, i'm a cd guy oh i mean i i have some and yeah obviously uh i have a few on my wall and right like, on i like cds i just i don't even fucking really have a cd player anymore yeah it's crazy i don't know what to do like i'm more apt to listen to vinyl than i'm a cd so check them out on the Book of Faces. Check them out on their website. Stock them on social media. And for fuck's sake, go to a show when it comes up. And God go damn it. <laughs> and go say hi. Terry, thank you so much, brother. This has been awesome. And I can't wait till I get the chance to check out Jamora Live and hear even more of your new material as it gets released. Well, there y'all have it. Killer melodic death metal from Seattle. Make sure you follow Dramora on all their channels. Like, subscribe, share, download their stuff. And also, do the same for me here on Misery Point Radio. And now, we're going to close this out with one more track from the debut EP Awakening. This one from Dramora called Reckoning. I'm a fool.
Join for the 